Welcome back into the Original Gangsters podcast. I am Scott Bernstein, along with my co-conspirator, partner in crime, uh, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. The doctor is in <laughs> for our latest session of OG podcasting, and we are incredibly lucky to have a exclusive interview with the real life Lamar Silas. If you're watching Black Mafia Family right now, the breakout star of the show outside of uh, Little Meech playing Big Meech is the main antagonist this season. Uh, the character's name is Lamar Silas. In reality, Lamar Silas is Leighton the Beast Simon. Mr. Simon, thank you for joining us on the Original Gangsters podcast and letting America know, letting the whole world know the real story behind the Black Mafia family television show that is now uh, on the Stars uh, cable network and is uh, just become a real uh, hot button topic for for pop culture uh, television enthusiasts. So, Leighton, uh, Mr. Simon, let's t- tell us what are your feelings on the show. Do you like the way you're being portrayed, or do you feel like uh, that you know they've taken kind of creative liberties with your character? Okay, like the part I haven't really seen all of it. But the parts I have been is like a uh, cartoonish to me. You know what I'm saying? I I don't understand it. But that's not me. You know, so I don't know if they took two sesame books and put it together and came up with that, but that's not me. Okay, so let's give people a little perspective. Um, maybe that uh, for for those who haven't watched the show or those are, are not incredibly well-versed on uh, the history of the Detroit underworld. But uh, the Black Mafia family, uh, Demetrius Big Meech Flannery and his brother, uh, Terry Flannery, they came up uh, in the southwest part of Detroit, um, some, you know, referred to as Down River uh, in, in some areas. And uh, Down River is kind of split up. Uh, there's kind of a white Down River area, and then there's there's a black Down River area. And this area uh, that Leighton Simon and the Flannerys uh, come from um, is a cluster of smoggy factory villages, River Rouge, Ecorse, Taylor, Inkster, uh, and then parts of Southwest Detroit that all kind of cluster together. And uh, Leighton came up, uh, and I'm going to let you expand on it in a second, came up in the 70s uh, underneath uh, the, the the big downriver drug Don Walter, the Black Fox Quezon, um, and then uh, did a prison sentence, came out of prison and kind of squared off with the Flannery brothers uh, over uh, territory in that part of town. That's not true? No, they met. And case I went in the back room and came out with two forty five in his hand and just took that shit. It wasn't no what he said it was like I t- yeah, get together. No, it was, he just took it. Wait, so let's 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 again let's clarify for the audience. Are you saying that Walter Kason had a issue with the Flannery brothers? He had an issue for all day money. Like I say, he just a man. So when did what I, I got? Let's get the timeline straight here. I thought that that Kason was locked up at the time that the Flannerys were coming on the scene, but that they were. But uh, Walter Kason at that point was still on the street. Yeah, Kason was out. Okay. I mean, soon, soon as Kason got out, he started to move on. He, he took they, he took it from him. Now, then he bought himself a Benz and he bought himself a Range Rover, allegedly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and you were one of Walter Kason's kind of m- most trusted lieutenants. Harold Stinson. But what, weren't you as well, Leighton? I know, I know Harold Stinson was, but weren't you also working for, for the Black Box? Well, that's kind of like a long story. When they, when they fell out, I was more like with Harold than I was with Kason. Okay. So let's, let's just start from the beginning of your story. So just tell us, the start of Leighton Simon, like where you grew up, what you were doing as a young man, and then how you got into the game and got introduced to Walter Kason and Harold Stinson. <laughs> well, I grew up playing baseball. You know, that that's what one of my greatest hobbies, you know. So I met Harold through his brother. His brother was named, we used to call him Chubby. Okay. So on the way, Oh, it's hard for me to play this, this baseball game in the area. 
I stopped by Chubb House. And it was a young guy out there named, they used to call him Dirty Diamond Dirt. You got it straight. Okay, my man had a, he had a ring on like, all together it was like 20 carats. Okay. And I, I, I asked about Dirty Diamond Dirt. So he told me, so they told me about Harold. So basically, that's how I met Harold through Dirty Diamond Dirt. Not just met him. That's how I got with him. I, I, I always knew about Harold and Kube, his brother. And k Stein, they was all cool. They grew up together. But like like it always happened, family members. k Stein, k Stein had a, a nephew that ended up telling on him. Telling on him. But his nephew jumped on Harold's sister and beat up real bad. So this this is the story of all the OGs from that downriver right. area. Just for, for people that right. aren't from Detroit, just so you know, uh, Mr. Simon, a lot of our audience is from you know isn't from Detroit. They're from around the world. So we just have to explain to them, uh, you know, how Detroit operates. You know how Detroit's uh, geography lays out. So. The people that we're talking about right now were the OGs of that area, of that area before the Flannerys were really even born in some cases, or were even in Detroit. Correct, correct, correct. So, so yeah. So keep on uh, telling your story. And that's what I'm saying. I was under them at the age of like 14. I started with them when I was 14. So this would have been in the in the 70s. Yeah, it, it, it would have been it, like uh, I would say. 72, because I brought a brand new Lincoln in 73. Well, not a brand new one, but I brought a Lincoln in, in 73 and I was 15. And this this is kind of guy here was, he was going, he, his whole crew, he, was, he bought them all Cadillacs, brand new Cadillacs. But when he came to me, I kind of like, I like to get things on my own. I don't like people to front things to me. You know what I'm saying? Because when you owe somebody money, you can't go to sleep when you want to. You got to get that money. So, I told him no thank you, and I, I got I got myself together and bought my own car and shit. You know what I'm saying? But now, you know, like you said, worldwide, it was a guy they called Philip Walls that Chester Campbell was working under him. You ever heard of Chester Campbell? Yes, of course. <laughs> okay. Chester, for, for people that don't know, Chester, Chester Campbell was uh, one of the most infamous hitmen ever to walk the streets of Detroit. Uh, and he worked with uh, African-Americans. He was African-American, but he worked in the African-American underworld, and he also worked uh, with the Italians and uh, was his reputation wrong from coast to coast in America, more than just Detroit. Right. Yeah, because you had said Detroit at first. I hear you now. No, it wasn't just Detroit. You know, he worked with the Italians. Yeah, so, you know, a matter of fact, when he ran into his poll and the police discovered his I would say a hitman book. I, I, you say you're not from Detroit? No, we're from Detroit. We're just telling you that our audience, okay. we have thousands and thousands of people that are listening okay. that are not from Detroit. Right, but this is how deep this guy was. You know, he, and I'll leave you around. I'm talking to everybody now because he's deceased now. A lot of names, I'm not going to talk about it. You know what I'm saying? Maybe in a cold or something like that. But when they found this book, Bill Bonds was the first one on it. He supposed to hit Bill Bonds. Now, if you notice, Bill Bonds started getting drunk at the end of his career. Well, I, I don't know if it was just at the end, but yes, he was a known heavy drinker. After he was done uh, giving the nightly news on television, he'd hit the bars. Now, I'm talking about after he found out about that, that book. You know what I'm saying? Because when he found out about that book, Jesse was, Jesse was still out. He got out. You know what I'm saying? And Brooke Patterson. Yeah, well, so what Layton is referring to is that uh, Chester Campbell was eventually brought down by the government uh, on a routine, what started off as a routine traffic stop uh, out in the suburbs, actually in uh, Kegel Harbor, uh, Michigan, which is right out uh, on the west side, West Bloomfield, uh, Farmington Hills era, area. Um, and he was going out to visit his girlfriend, and uh, the police started chasing him. They eventually caught him after like a 20 mile chase and they found a black book 
that had right. that was like a hit list of judges, politicians, media members like Bill Bonds, uh, politicians like right. Brooke Patterson, uh, and then they had uh, their addresses and uh, their right. phone numbers, and then he had like a, a murder kit in his trunk. Correct. Now his downfall is when he went when he went to visit his parole officer. I any pen fell out of his pocket, and when his parole officer picked it up, it was a pistol. It was it was like. Something like what they call them. Uh, it was a pen gun. It was a pen gun. Like he was like, just for, for there people. You go. Yeah. For people that have uh, never heard of Chester Campbell, uh, try to imagine if you had a evil James Bond 007 and you, you, you melded him with John Wick, the fictional John Wick and Hannibal, right. Le- Hannibal <laughs> Lecter, and you have right. Chester Campbell. Now, the Hannibal Lecter part was. This, uh, I, I don't know if you could say say they he was gay. His name was Dixie. They Ch- called him Dixon. Ch- you think Ch- Chester was homosexual? No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. It was like when you say far, I think you said something about, you know, cutting up and calm or something like that. That that was this guy they called Dixon. Dixie. He would cut people up. Well, it was a he she. Now you do your research, do it do it on Dixie. So, so to keep on telling us uh, your story, so you're, you're coming up in the 70s under Harold Stinson, and how does he eventually get together with Kason? They, they grew up together. Okay. They grew, okay. Up, they grew up together, but you talk about how they end up having a few? Yes. So eventually Stinson and Kason fell out. They fell out because Bobby jumped on Linda. Now, Bobby was Kason's nephew. Linda Stinson was Harold's sister. So they was a friend of mine's house, the give they called him the givers back then. And they used to always like have basically an argument as far as who had the most money. So it led up to Bobby jumping on her and beating her real bad. So when Bob stepped in five out, he went down to the bar called the Electric Lounge looking for one of the spencers. They couldn't find him. They couldn't find water or whatever. But they ran into a guy named Al, Al, Al Winston. You know what I'm saying? And he ended up shooting Bobby in the head. So about a month after that, allegedly, Hell ran into another Stinson in a club called The Name of the Game and killed him. You know what I'm saying? So it's like it just got deeper off of that. It started with, Two people that did not basically one person didn't have nothing to do with the drug life with the girl. But Bobby Bobby was with K Sound for a minute too. He told her he told everything on him and shit. You know what I'm saying? But it started like that. It started with a little bit of small family too. Like I say, hell K Sound was the best friend, but the part I can't understand now is K Sound is best friends with Kube now, which Kube is Harold's brother. Did Harold end up dead? Yes. They, they, he was at UBQ. There's a club here called UBQ. It's a popular club. You know, everybody had on like $4,000 to $10,000 clothes on. So they got into it and they followed him home. So Bobby had been doing training, rifle training for like eight months. Okay, now this guy named Dave Johnson, who they said did it, was legally blind. That's why Kason, it's almost kind of, uh, he was kind of wise. He he put it up like Dave did it. And that's how they beat the case, because they found out Dave couldn't even sleep. But they caught they caught Hill going through the house and sat him like underneath his arm and he bled to death. So when does Walter Kason get locked up? Hmm. I would say like maybe maybe eight years after that. So did you get locked up? Did did, did, the case. Did you get locked up with Walter? Not with him. I was I was in there. I was in there with him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that was like. How long did did you serve? uh, Three altogether. Three years. So you come out, and when do you first meet the Flannery brothers? At the fight at uh, a. So it was Hagler and. 
Tommy Hearn fight. I know who did that because uh, in Vegas, Hagler had like eight to one to win until Detroit came in. They changed odds. Everybody from Detroit was betting on Tommy Hearns, the favorite son. Yes. Because one of the reasons why everyone that, uh, every, every fighter that Marvin fought, he went the whole round in beating the fighter. Tommy Hearns knocked all of them out. You know, like Duran, Quavis. But when the Hagler fought them, he caught, you know, can I say hell? I don't you know. Yeah you, yeah, you can, yeah, you can swear. It's okay. Okay, but he caught, he caught hell with him. So everybody was geeked up that Hearn was going to do the same thing to Hagler. Now, when, when I was standing there watching it, some young guy kept on bumping it to me. At first, I didn't pay no attention. But then, when I was out to 50 boys, you know what I'm saying? I was like, wait a minute, you know, this, this you know, this guy keeps bumping into me. And then he'd go back over there and talk with them 50 boys. So the next time he done, I said, my man, the next time you, you bump into me, I'm going to do great Bobby Hound to you, okay? Man, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. And I'm like, you ain't got to do all that. Just don't bump into me no more because, I mean, it's obvious that you're doing it on purpose. You know, I don't, I don't, the 50 boys building you up or something. I don't know why you're doing this shit. You know what I'm saying? But that's how I made him at the fight. So this was, you were in in Vegas? This is? Yes. Oh, wow. We, yeah, we were in Vegas. And, and Scott, tell us about the 50 boys crew just for some yeah, context. Yeah, so uh, the 50 boys crew was a small. That's real funny. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tee it up for you and then. And then you, you're gonna give some color to the uh, story I'm about to tell the audience. The Fifty Boys. I'm gonna get a truth. I'm gonna yeah. get a truth to it. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Fifty Boys was a uh, a small neighborhood drug click uh, in in this downriver area in Detroit that uh, got the name Fifty Boys because they sold uh, fifty uh, fifty dollar packs of drugs, and they were led by a a, a small time. Um, local uh, drug boss named uh, Edric E. D. Boyd, uh, and they're in the in the uh-huh. in the show in the Black Mafia Family show. When you meet Demetrius and Terry, they are part of the Fifty Boys crew, and so that's right now. If you're watching the show, Demetrius is a Fifty Boy. So tell us who the oh, Fifty okay. Boys. Tell us who the Fifty Boys were in your mind. Oh. Uh. I would say Poppy, got it called Poppy, and you know, basically, all right, this would happen for them getting my attention. I was on electric, and my brother had took a bag from one of them full of fifties, and he said, you know, they just called me dog. He said, dog, it's like these fifties look like eight balls. And I said, oh shit, they can't be that big. So when he showed me one, I damn near fell out the chair. I'm like, damn. How the fuck are they doing this and shit? It was like eight balls for $50. Okay. Now that kind of like, it didn't really affect me. It affected me on, like in Detroit a little bit for a minute on 12th Street because I rode 12th Street. I don't know where they get that from. 12th Street, I had 12th Street for about eight years with no problem. Except for you no know, one time when they try to, you know, enter my turf, they, they start trying to sell dope. And the driveway of the apartment. Now, my sorry ass people call me over there to take care of. I'm like, y'all yeah, take care of it. That's not my that's not my problem. So, you know, one of my boys wasn't there, Mike Green. Mike Green would have handled. But the rest of them just like, you know, they was up. Who So when I came over there Real quick, we're, two we're, of them had me. Well, real quick, Layton. I'm learning this myself. Um so I, in the in the sh- in the show you have uh, uh, Demetrius and Terry being with the 50 boys, and then you have this other crew known as the 12th Street Boys. Are you saying that that 12th Street area was your uh, territory? Man, I had that whole, you had anybody check, I had that 12th Street at this apartment. It was about like eight units there. I had that, I had that spot for about, I'll say, eight years. And I left because I wanted to. Because... I think they they was connected with this police named Sam. And Sam moved in the apartment. 
So I said, I don't, you know, I don't want to deal with all this shit. So I just left. I left it with Serena. They ain't run nobody off. They couldn't run nobody off. Now, if you notice in the movie, uh, they said, well, you know, it, it kind of slow today. We, we ain't been getting, we ain't been getting the sales. Talk about the 50s, right? What happened, I came out with what I called Flintstone. I had the same size they had, but it was for $10. So they only was 50 boys for about a week. I wiped them out with the Flintstone. You understand? Eight balls for $10. And didn't have that baking soda on it. What they was doing, they was calling that double bubble shit. They take, they take, they take an ounce and make two ounces. That's how they was doing that. But my prices were so low, I could do it for allegedly for ten dollars. Like I said, they said it. They said it in the movie. Like it was, it was slow for them. Yeah, it was slow for y'all because it was all. On electric, electric was called Flint. The houses I had on electric was called Flintstone houses because the rocks were so big. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So was was there a 12th Street Boys crew? Like, who were they? Seriously, not that I know of. Like I said, I, I, did, I just heard about them through my brother. But, you know, I got all this shit being, like, geeked up more than what it was. Okay. So, so was the it... The same one you're talking about, Edric. What's his name? E.D. Edric. Yeah, Edric, E.D. Now, he used to call my boy. They asked me, could he come out here? Three times. The last time, his allegedly wife died. And he made a phone call to my people. Asked like, it's all right for me to visit my wife's room. Okay? So, I don't know where they get that notorious, 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 notorious person don't have to call people to ask, can they come back to their neighborhood? He needs facts. You know what I'm saying? And basically, at this time, Bobby was under hell. Bobby was like the godfather of what's out here. So Bobby, you know, he, he, he bought, he had a meeting. So I'm like, yeah, he come out, he come out here anytime he want to. You know, I wish you would stop asking me that shit. You know what I'm saying? So you're saying that the ED would have to ask your permission to come back into the neighborhood? He wouldn't talk to me. He would talk to a friend of mine. You know, I haven't asked him because, you know what I'm saying? But I would call him Bob B. Now, when you do your research, you're going to find out who he is. But Bob, Bobby B. He used to call him. And then he would call me. You understand? And in other words, get my permission, could he come back out here? Now, he don't know that it's a certain car you can be in with tinted windows, dark tinted windows. But, you know, I had friends to tell me who he was. So when he did just come out here without so-called asking me, he had come out here in an all tinted out car. You know, which you think I didn't know, but... I'm a street person. I can tell when a car has spotted me and it slows down and then it bags up and shit. So I did my research and I found out who it was, who it was in that car. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, you know, it's, it's no such thing as a motherfucking ruling. Ruling, you know, a certain area. It just, that's something that, that's in a person's head. The police rule this area if you want to get down to the truth. You know what I'm saying? And that's one of the reasons why they give me so much flight. And I'm proud of myself. I never did work with the police. Never will. You know what I'm saying? But when you get to a certain level, they coming at you. Either you going to work for them, or they're going to bust you. So you know? are we talking about corrupt police? Is that what, that's what we're saying, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the DPD was notorious back then for being involved in the drug trade. Or, ext- or, extorting, or extorting those that right. were involved in the right. drug trade. Okay, yeah, yeah, allegedly. I came up doing stress. And I'm going to tell you how rough stress was for us killing people. We used to be on the corner. Now, when the big boy, when the big folk came, they would jump out and beat us up or whatever and shit. 
take our stuff with over the shit. Okay, that's cool. But when stress was created, stress used to taste you and kill you. Okay? Now, it got so bad when we was on the corner when you left the basin, they'll pull up. We just start shooting at them. You might as well. You know what I'm saying? We just start shooting at stress. Because when they chase you, if they chase three people, one gonna be dead. Okay, the last one, the last one they killed was Malice Green. Yeah, let, let's let so the they, audience. They viewed it as self defense. Let's let the audience know. Uh, not so, not uh, stress. The the people in yeah, the yeah. But community. let's tell let's tell the audience what stress is. So stress was a uh, a an undercover drug unit uh, put right. into place in the Detroit Police Department in the early seventies and kind of given a, for all intents and purposes, given a license to kill on the street. Right. Uh, It was a, uh, it was a high, uh, high priority unit that only the top uh, drug cops could get on. And then once they got on the, on the stress unit, they were let loose. And there was something like two, I, I might be misquoting the number, but there was something like two dozen, uh, suspicious killings uh, that this stress unit was involved in. And this is what uh, Layton is, is, is referencing uh, where uh, the, the people that they were ostensibly trying to arrest ended up dead uh, either after questioning or uh, so, so, and then he also referenced the big four, which was a, I think the precursor to stress which was a, a group of yeah. four police officers back in the late 60s that would uh, come and kind of use thuggish law enforcement tactics on the guys. Yes. And stress stress stood for Stop the Robberies, Enjoy Safe Streets. It was an acronym just for if people aren't <laughs> familiar with the, the history of... They were the talking about themselves, though. Yeah, <laughs> right. They right. ought to be. They had one named Hawk. He, he was like 360 pounds. He was the main one. Uh, the big, the big, the big folk, you know, that would, you know, he would make you like try to sell dope for him and shit, you know what I'm saying? Allegedly, you know what I'm saying? So I guess that money was too slow, so they created stress. Now I'm gonna tell you, stress was prejudice because it was some, it was a most of game out here called the Blue Angels. It was on 4th Street and other drive. They used to kill one of them like every two weeks. And were they were they mil- okay. mostly a white group? Yeah, they were white motorcycle. Group, the Blue Angels. Okay, the Blue Angels. They were not present about what they were doing. They were killing both races. I think there was part of building the stress unit was uh, diversifying uh, the the policing in Detroit. I think there were a number of African American police officers that were put on that stress unit. I, I've never seen one though. Okay, I could be wrong. You you lived it. I've just researched it. You're the OG. No, I mean, you're the OG's OG, it's, 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 OG it's, it's, here. You might be right. My, 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 my response was I never seen one. I know Jimmy. I know Jimmy Harris, who was a a very very prominent uh, DPD officer in the '80s, who worked directly for Coleman Young and was involved in all the white boy Rick uh, shenanigans. I know he was. Uh, um, a member of the stress unit, and he's African American, so that's kind of part of where I'm. Where I'm okay, going. Okay, I got you. I hear you. Okay, well, you know, they, they, they didn't. He didn't come out to South Detroit as far as my knowledge. I never, <laughs> I never seen. It's uh, it's a whole the, the the southwest part of Detroit, that downriver area of River Rouge, Ecorse, uh, Inkster, Taylor. Like it's a city within a city. I mean, people uh, people talk about Detroit. They talk about the East Side. They talk about the West Side. Um, but Southwest Detroit and that era, that area, I can't say, <laughs> whenever I'm trying to say area, I say era, that area, um, is just, it's, it's a world within a world within a world. Um, and it's been like that for a long time. Cause that, that's where all the auto major auto plants were a lot of the, um, uh, Southern migration up to the Midwest, uh, starting in the, you know, in the forties and fifties, uh, uh, African-American families coming up for jobs in the auto factories. Uh, you either, you know, uh, set up shop East side, West side, or Southwest where you were actually closer to the plants where you were actually living like 
down the street from the plant as opposed to having to take a bus ride to where you were working. And uh, it's it's very it's a very unique area. And if you're not if you haven't lived it, if you haven't been in it, it's hard to explain to people. Let me ask uh, Leighton. So because Southwest Detroit was it's you know such a unique part of the city. Were were you familiar with any of like the the major kingpins that we know about from that period on the east side or the west side, like Butch Jones? You mentioned Chester Campbell. What about like Marzette, Butch Jones or Marzette, right? Marzette, the Curry, the Curry boys. Right. Did, did any of those guys ever have any interactions with 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 the guys that were in Southwest Detroit? <laughs> no, not 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 that I that I know of. He come from a different world, man, than the East Side and the West Side guys. They like they program they like for twenty or twenty five. Now what we was trying to do is get off into it and get out and start businesses. But you I, I found out you never tell anybody when you finna get out because the police find out and they coming at you. One thing about the movies, all that is true. Yeah. When you know oh, that was Sugar that out, was Sugar Hill, that was Sugar Hill. I mean and a lot more other movies like Super Fight and all that. They don't want you to get out. You know, see like if you tell like if you tell your your right hand man, somehow it gets back to him. You know what I'm saying? And you know how I get back to him. I just said my right hand man, like and see you could be standing so much just like uh, when I stopped trusting my right hand man, I'm standing, I'm standing on the corner and everybody's speaking to me. And he said, damn, why everybody speaking to you and won't even speak to me? You know what I'm saying? See, things like that you got to pay attention to. You know what I'm saying? Because they're giving you a warning that they want what you got. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Ex- so Expand on what you said about the east side being flamboyant because you got a lot of flash and dash the over there. Oh, a lot of flashy that. I don't know why they couldn't see white boy Rick coming. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't go nowhere near him. The boy was number fourteen. It was like I just need to do some research on this guy. You know what I'm saying? But he had a nice car. I believe he had a white business then and he had them ropes around his neck. So everybody just gravitated to him because of that. I wouldn't fuck with him. I made him on Hamilton and a uh, uh Hamilton and like six mile road. He left the cop up in the middle of the street and got out. But all four doors open and got out, went to the store. But one of them guys was a guy named they called Huggy Bear. Now Huggy Bear, Bush Jones. Bush Jones wrote a book about this fat guy Farley. And that's a lie. Huggy Bear used to set up shop. And when he made like sixty he get up to like sixty thousand a day. Bush used to come and drop his crew off. And basically uh, it's like a takeover, but he would he used to follow Huggy everywhere Huggy went. Butch would go, you know what I'm saying? And Paul Raymond people, Raymond people had the audacity to trust that guy. Yep, you know, so you can put that together. What happened? Well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But uh, yeah. you know, Butch, I didn't respect Butch. You know what I'm saying? Because he used he used a lot of kids. You know what I'm saying? Allegedly killed a lot of kids just because they wanted to get paid. Just because they wanted to buy their mama some milk or some bread. Now, he don't work these boys to death. What he do? He'll work them to death and then fire them or beat them up and then get another crew. You know, I'm like, no person that's in this game, you know, should be looked up to. But a lot of times, we ain't had nobody else to look up to. That's what, you know, you hear this a lot. That's what they left us. And then it was dropped off in that neighborhood. But you ain't got to be that vicious like that, man. You use for the kids, you know, to make money like that. You know what I'm saying? So, Butch Jones was the head of YBI, Young Boys Incorporated. Uh, if you're watching the Black Mafia Family Show, they've been referenced a number of times as being real inspirations to the Flannery Brothers for uh, the, the Black Mafia Family organization that would eventually take flight, that they were... Uh, using some of the blueprint of YBI. YBI was started by Butch Jones and Baby Ray Peoples and uh, WW right. Wonderful Wayne Davis. And uh, allegedly, like uh, Layton said, 
Uh, Butch Jones had both baby Ray Peoples and WW uh, murdered uh, and just kind of wanted the whole thing for himself. And he was using... Allegedly. Uh, allegedly. And he was using 11, 12-year-old, 10-year-old right. boys on elementary school uh, uh, playgrounds to be the guys that were moving his product. And uh, I mean, it, I, I'm talking about, I don't mean to cut you off, but I'm not talking about, he was using kids that was living with rats, you know, because their mama wouldn't bring it nothing to head. You know what I'm saying? Rats was eating them. You know what I'm saying? And, and then the boys had to bring something home or, you know, they might try to eat they self. You know what I'm saying? Or they sit there something because, you know, when you get real hungry, your mind go to a survival mode. You know what I'm saying? You kind of lose your mind. You want to eat. You know, a perfect example of what happened in Louisiana. You know, doing, doing that flood. But, like I said, I didn't respect him. And then when he wrote that book, he put k name in there. He ain't no k -Sar. You know what I'm saying? And the people that was, like, after k they was all dead and shit. But when they used k it brought them back out. You know, it brought the people back out after uh, k -Sar. You know, that's kind of like, I would say, not drastic. He just snitching. Yeah, he wrote a book. Uh, Bush. He, what the what he's referencing is that in 1996 or seven, Butch Jones put out a self-published autobiography where he just let it all fly. I mean, uh, fast and loose, yeah. and told you know told everybody's secrets and every story, every anecdote was kind of yeah. made to a uh, to for, for like self-aggrandizing purposes for Butch. Yeah. But meanwhile, he's throwing all these people underneath the bus, and not just bringing not just bringing yeah, heat to very, him, uh, but bringing heat to them. Now you remember the part where he said uh, he hid in, in a garbage can and waited for this guy to bring the garbage out. Yep. And then when the guy brought the garbage out, he hit him. I'm like, damn, that case might be still open. What kind of deal did he made with people that you know he should say some shit like that? So you know, I I didn't believe it. You know what I'm saying? Like I say, you know, I might be putting y'all because I'm going to tell you the truth about what I went through and shit. You know what I'm saying? But I know I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Matter of fact, I kept on telling Huggy, man, won't you, uh, you know what I'm saying? Take this nigga out to dinner or something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I never forget that term because when uh, case on at, at his case, they said that Kason said to take Hero out. And his lawyer said, take Hero out. Where? To lunch? You know what I'm saying? To a basketball game or what? Uh, you knew what Mr. Kason said. What he meant when he said that this Bobby, his so-called nephew, was up on the stand just telling, just telling. And the reason why he told him is because he thought Kason was sleeping with his wife. Right. I don't give a damn if it was him. I'm making that much money what they was making. You know, he didn't wait for Now they both 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 of them supposed to put boxing gloves on and went in the backyard and sell that shit. No, this fool go to the Fed. The Fed wasn't really on uh uh case out as far as the street, you know, where you know you know how they do, they might work on it. But it wasn't out in the street that they were looking for case Yeah. Until Bobby told everything. You so, understand? Yep. So and see that's what, and that and that's where we start losing the village. Now, like I was telling my boy, I said, you know what? Black people unconsciously was like following the mob. They were doing like the mob was doing. You know what I'm saying? We was taught not to snitch. You know, if you gotta go to jail, go to jail. Now out of ten we keep your mouth shut. Everybody go home because they don't have nothing. Anytime the detective want to talk to you, they don't have it all. They want, they want you to put it together. But when, uh, what's his name, Joe Valachi? Yeah, Joe Valachi. Joe Valachi. So when he started snitching, it just started, it started catching on. It started catching on. You know what I'm saying? And then when that crack came out, see, back then when I was coming up, you had to have a reputation to get off into this business. You had to have one. You know, you had to have heart. Now, 
when that crack came out, you had grandmamas, great great grandmas. I was against the wall when a guy was born in 1896. One time, when I was on the east side, they came in on the. I said, "Damn, 1896! How old is your brother?" Fit? You know what I'm saying? So it, it's like everything just changed. Everything has changed now. You know, it's a different world out like there now. You know what I'm saying? Just like when you when you had a beef with the police, you had a beef with one. Like now, my brother, he had caught a case of empty, but we didn't know about it. So we ran down the river like twenty deep, and this, this guy was be notorious. Sam, I'm getting that name. He's a police officer. I think that ball head guy in the movie is playing his part. I'm not for sure, but Sam ain't have no ball head, nothing like that. But he, he he was very he was he was on both sides of the law. So he's talking about the Steve anyway, Harris, the Steve Harris character who, uh, if you're right. familiar with the, the the television show The Practice back in the day, he was in okay, that, and yeah, then he was yeah. all he was also in Sugar Hill. I'm pretty sure Steve Harris he played. Uh, they oh, called yeah. him. Go- okay. They played him. Gog- they called him Goggles. I think I do remember something like that. Yeah. So. Uh, Layton, let's. We only got about ten minutes left, and I wanna. I don't want to bury okay. the. Le- I don't want to bury the lead here. We can definitely have you back on. You're always welcome uh, on the OG podcast because you are a true OG's OG, and we always benefit from the knowledge, the insight, and the perspective from, you know, going to the root of what we study, uh, getting to the, uh, you know, to the. Uh, the crux of the issue is going right to the source for people like yourself to school the, the BGs like Jimmy and I, the OGs need to, to, to school the BGs. But, um, I, and if you're uncomfortable talking about this, I get it. But, uh, let's just talk about this last 10 minutes about, I'm not, I'm not used to it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Go ahead. Let's talk about how Demetrius Flannery ended up leaving Detroit. So that story's never really been told. The reason why I told you about Sam and all that, because it got out. And this is one of the, uh, one of the reasons why he didn't want to fuck with me. That's why I brought that out. You know, certain of the things that I have done, he knew I wasn't nothing to fuck with. Yep. You know, point blank. Because, all right, Doc, ask me, ask, ask me a question again about... I was, just gonna, you know, I was just saying that... You why, know. Why, did I, why did I shoot him? <laughs> no, we don't have to, we don't we don't have to go into that at this second, but just let's start from <laughs> let's start from there was there was a, a couple years there where things got pretty intense and uh your brother ended up being uh killed in a shooting uh at a Coney Island in May of nineteen eighty seven that I know No, that, no, no. That's not what happened. No, was that was you talking about with the with that, with that, he got a whole bunch of times though. It might be going on. Go ahead, I'll make a joke. Go ahead. No, you tell you me. You, you, you tell me. Your, your, uh, am I right? Well, your brother, I'm talking about which, which, which one? Which, which shoot you talking about? Though? Your brother, El, your Elvis, your brother Elvis was was killed, right? Yeah, but I'm I'm, I'm trying to ask you what shoot is you referring to because Elvis, Elvis had, listen, listen, dog. Elvis got shot five times, five different times. So you, if you talk about the Michi incident, yeah, Elvis got killed. When he got killed, okay. Now, this, 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 this is what I found out. Uh, now, that broad that's playing that part in bed with uh, Yolanda, damn, they picked a good one. She, they, they look just alike. Now, the type of bitch she was, like, she was a straight up troublemaker. I should try to get my brother not to mess with them girls that he caught, because they just sex chasers, all of them was. But they was beautiful, but at the same time, that's not what we looking for. We looking for, like, nurses. Or, you know, somebody that, that's opposite from you. But one day she called me over there. And when my brother called me, he said, well, I don't want to talk to her. So I go over there. He said, I'm going to go downtown and meet some people. And if I'm not back in 15 minutes, I'm dead. I said, uh-huh. He said, so what do you think I should do? So I looked at my brother like, fuck with you, tell me bitch. I said, well, listen here. First of all, don't go. If you think somebody's going to kill you, you know, don't go. You know what I'm saying? I said, that's what the fuck you called me over here for? Because I couldn't stand the bitch. You know what I'm saying? Because she was one of them, you know, sack chasers. She'd go from my brother to another one. And I don't know why he liked the women like that. But, okay, 
it was it was his birthday, and me and him did not really have time to hang that much. You know what I'm saying? Because we was just like in different worlds and shit, though, right? But that was that was my dog, though. But damn, he was difficult. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that motherfucker would shoot you if you just said hi to him. Him and this guy named Peanut got to shoot out in church because <laughs> Peanut Peanut wanted his ring back. That my brother was wearing. My brother told him, "Like, listen, nigga, I'm showing off. I give it back to you when we leave." Peanut stopped in the air in the church. Gave that church with that that preacher, uh, Reverend Miles. Reverend Miles church. He started shooting up in there. Give my goddamn ring back. My brother still wouldn't give it to him. Shit, right? Because they they feel best for it, and he knew Peanut wasn't gonna shoot him. Like, you know what I'm saying? He was just kind of wild. So, Edric, I believe, and Elvis had gotten a beef about that girl. But I was on Elvis about, man, you got to leave that shit alone because, you know, we finna get out. I'm finna start a business for our selling clothes. I met this guy in Japan. He gave me uh, gators for $20, real gators, and Adidas suit. Adidas suit was real hot back then for $10. And they was legit. They were the same, the same thing. People was getting a hundred something. So I bought a store, and I was getting ready, you know, go legit. That's the only reason why I think he didn't tell me that he was feuding with motherfuckers, right? Now, when I went there, they kept on telling me Edric had a gun. So I'm saying, like, so he got a gun. Now, they of telling me, listen, like, Edric got a gun, and him and Elvis been beefing. You know, I cut my butt out to this, to this day. Because he didn't tell me. Because either I just would have left to avoid that bullshit, because I'm on another level now. I ain't, I'm not on that gangster shit no more. You know, I don't prove my point, which I didn't really prove no point. That was just me. See, a lot of motherfuckers try to be gangsters. You know, that cartoon gangster shit, that was just my personality. So if you want to call me gangster, I guess that's what I was. But I didn't fuck with nobody unless they fuck with me. So anyway, so anyway, I, I go talk to you about right now. Man, in the bathroom, like Green, we talking. Next thing I know, Edric and some strange guy come in the bathroom. So I'm fixing the bitch. I said, God damn, my motherfucker can't even go nowhere to talk. No, these motherfuckers, you know. Now, all the while, this nigga is pointing this nigga out to me. You know, you know, he he was going to kill me. You know what I'm saying? Because he knew I was, I was backbone. I don't know shit. So I left out. Me and Mike got finished talking and shit. So a line to pull us up. So Elvis and myself, we started talking about it like, you know, I forget what we were saying to it, but the shit was funny because I remember laughing like a motherfucker and shit, though. But this nigga started shooting and shit. So he meant to try to run past me, and I grabbed him. I grabbed him and used him as a shield. So the guy wouldn't shoot me yet because I had to meet you. Like, let me go. You ain't going nowhere, nigga. She is. To this motherfucker around the bullets or something. You know what I'm saying? So, my brother was coming around the corner, and the guy shot him. And he died instantly. I could, I, I seen it. I seen his ass. So, that's one part I could say was, you know, it, it, it was positive. You know what I'm saying? Me and that game, that game, she can happen like that. But he didn't suffer. He went straight out. Because I found out the guy shot him in his heart and shit, right? You know what I'm saying? So, now, Demetrius is going around. Now, I might be ahead of myself. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Or, or, or you got some more? I mean, no, I'm just trying to see where I'm at with it. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Keep keep, keep on going. This is a good story. Okay, I hear you. <laughs> so, 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 so. Now, Demetrius is going around talking about he has something to do with it. Shit. So, like I said, Bobby called us together because this shit getting on my nerves. So what happened, my nephew got killed. You know, he got beat to death. You know, so I was, I was sitting in front of the house, and some nigga came, you know, the N-word, I don't know what that, and the N-word came and said, uh, Michi said, he didn't have nothing to do with killing your nephew. He said, I'm like, what the fuck? Who this boy leave me the fuck along with this bullshit, right? So we talked to Bobby. I said, look, me, you need to, like, put a lid on this shit, man. Because, you know, it's starting to get on my goddamn nerve. I'm telling you, you don't want to be on my bad side, man. 
You know what I'm saying? So he said that quietly or whatever and shit. So the next day, I come in the club. You know, I, I, I had a link made that two people had to hold that motherfucker. Every now and then, you know what I'm saying? His mink coat. That, you know, yeah, this yeah. for people that aren't from Detroit. One of the two things that are really big in the in the Detroit street culture are mink coats and gator boots. So <laughs> I don't know what they what they do oh, in other yeah. parts of the country, but if you're trying to show off, uh, you're going around the city of Detroit and you want to uh, show everyone that you're a true OG, you show up in a uh, you know a, a a train length mink coat with uh, with gator boots on. Yeah, cause, cause they, they they thought I was on three four, but uh, I wasn't off in them gator boots. I was off in the gators, but I I didn't like them cowboy the cowboy look legit. You know what I'm saying? I do. So I basically go to New York and have my own style made up. Cause you you take a pair of shoes to New York, they can make them mothers up in like a half hour. You know what I'm saying? So I had a pair I had a pair of gators that had alligator eyes in the front of that motherfucker. <laughs> Huh? That's some OG. Yeah. That's some OG shit. So a lot of people. <laughs> so like, so that day when I came in in, in the perfect beat, I said you might put together you listen to me real good. I said beat, and I said the name. Okay, now coming the perfect beat is by twenty of the with the Black Mafia or something. Okay, boys. okay, the Fifty Boy, Fifty Boy. Then okay. I come in the club, me and my wife, we come in the club. Now, I guess they, it got out that I had a, see the coat I had made, I had a pocket made for my Uzi. You know what I'm saying? So I could just go, I could put my hand in the coat and I didn't have to put it out. It just, it'll go to work in my pocket. You know, that's too much time to be pulling that motherfucker out to do something. All right, now, they got up and left. Damn, they ran like the motherfucker, all 20 of them. I'm like, what the fuck on these motherfuckers? Now, the manager came to me and said, listen, man, you got to stop one of my damn customers off. The motherfucker's scared of you and shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Now, I know it was me, and, and I don't think his brother was there. You know what I'm saying? But I got to throw this in kind of quick. I kind of respect me. Uh, uh, no, nah, me. Because he didn't tell, he didn't tell it. The incident that occurred, you know what I'm saying? Like, like I said, we talk about that at another time when I, when I got, when I got it into his deep with it. Cause I, I'm angry as fuck, man. Cause like the rumor is going around, you know what I'm saying? I try my best not to pay attention to the rumor. But when he sent that boy over, it just pissed me off. Now he knew I stayed on Ethel Street. And he had the Coney Island. It's about 20 of them. You know? Yeah, yeah. So it's about, it, it's about, like I say, I say 20, because, you know, people always add on shit, but it was about, about 15 of them and shit. But, like, when I, when I turned the corner, they all watched me partying like a motherfucker. So I was there at, you know, at disrespect, because I told him, I'm tired of the rumors. And, you know, basically, you need to stay away from me for a while. Don't be putting yourself in my face. So I went home. Got my hood and came back up there. I come down the shape, but the police was standing outside there. They was in front of uh, what they call a mini station, three of them. I ain't give a fuck. I pulled up in the Coney Island. Got in the, the little Jeep with me. Meet And emptied 17 rounds at this motherfucker. And I damn near lost it because he was so far underneath the steering wheel. I said, what the fuck at? that? And I ended up only hitting one time in the neck. I was like, God damn, but I jumped on the plane and went to uh, Buffalo, Buffalo, New York. Right? Like, I didn't know where the fuck I was at. But when I called all of my people, they said he was all right. I was like, damn. You know. But he took off. He left Detroit at that point. Yeah. Yeah, that's when he, that's, that's when, you know, I heard he took off and shit, though. Which I don't blame him because I wasn't I wasn't really finished. This was uh this you know was what a, I'm saying, Yes, you were not finished. He if he wouldn't have left, you would have finished the job, clearly, allegedly. Allegedly, you know what I'm saying? You know, because like I said, I, I, I try to talk to him, little fella. 
But you know what I'm saying? So, she, I, I guess he, he, he owed me for getting rich in Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, uh, Layton, yeah, this, this has been amazing. <laughs> you are a walking soundbite and a great storyteller. This has to be one of the the true uh epic episodes that we've uh, put together in our couple years of doing this whenever we can get it right from the 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 horse's mouth if you will um it, yeah. it's, it's priceless it's it's invaluable uh we want to have you back on as soon as possible uh and we just yeah in studio we wanted to have you in studio uh you can come in we'll go out to eat afterwards in chop studio, it up even more get you in and studio. let everyone know the real story um, of of the Black Mafia family started here. Started with Leighton Simon. They call him the Beast. And uh, for people that are watching the show right now, Lamar Silas, the real Lamar Silas, is Leighton the Beast Simon. And we uh, couldn't uh, thank thank you. We could we can't thank you enough for coming on the OG podcast and and sharing with us your story and your knowledge. Yeah, that kind of made me comfortable because I'm not used to talking. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm not really a talker, but you know the way I treated me, I respected that. So you know, well, we respect you. Same to you, brother. You know what I'm saying? Because like I say, uh, no brag, but fact, I got a lot more about Southwest Detroit and about all the real gangsters, man. You know what I'm saying? Yep. The real ones, the ones that didn't tell on each other. <laughs> yep. This is you know, the. This is. I keep on saying this is the OG's OG. I mean, when you're talking about someone that's an OG and, and you're talking about who does an OG look up to, they look up to Leighton Simon. Right. And then, like I said, I got, I got a couple of moments I look up to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And like I said, my man Bob, Bob, Bob at the beat was one of them. Leighton, this was great. You've done it all. You've said it all. We're going to wrap up right now. Please check okay. us out on all the social media accounts. Like, share, um, what else do they do, Jimmy? Yeah, on spread media? the word. TikTok, <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, at Gangster Podcast. Right now, that's how we're, you know, our analytics are going up, man. Yeah. More downloads, more likes, and it's all because, you know, word of mouth, people spreading the word. People so are going to like it. people are going to like this, Layton. They're going to love. Man, listen, man. Yeah, this is it. Like I said, y'all yeah, make me come because, what's his name? Vibe? Vlad. DJ Vlad. He said it every yeah. more time. Yeah, and he didn't get shit out of me. It was fun. He <laughs> thought he was going to get some shit. I took him all the way around the world and came back to nothing. He said, man, you ain't told me nothing. I said, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't like you. You know, the questions you ask. Right? We scoop. We got okay, to man, I'm going to hold y'all up, man. But uh, I'm going to stick with my boy, and he'll let me know things, man, because, you know, this is my right arm right here. Thanks, there Layton, you know. man. And shout yeah, out to JD. That. Shout out to JD, who's a big friend of the program and, and uh, someone I consider uh, family down in Southwest Detroit. He's my guy, and we're going to have him on the show as well. Uh, so thanks a lot, JD, for setting this up. Thank you, Layton Simon, Jimmy Bucciolato, Scott Bernstein. We'll be back next week with the OG podcast. We are out. Mm-hmm.